Hello students. Today I'm going to talk on the topic, the hepatobiliary system, which comprises of the liver, the biliary tree, and the gallbladder. First, let's talk about the liver. So the liver is the largest gland of the body consisting of both exocrine and endocrine parts. Exocrine part secretes bile, which is conveyed by the biliary passages. Endocrine part secretes some important chemical substances. It performs a wide range of metabolic activities necessary for homeostasis, nutrition, and immune response. Lobes of the liver. The liver presents anatomical and physiological right and left lobes caudate and quadrate lobes, and sometimes a riddle slope is present. So here you can see the anatomical lobes of the liver. This is the right lobe and this is the left lobe. These two anatomical right and left lobes are demarcated by the line um, of attachment of the falciform ligament. This falciform ligament is a double layered peritoneal fold which attaches the anterior surface of the liver to the undersurface of the diaphragm, the anterior abdominal wall up to the umbilicus. And on the posterior and the inferior respect, you can see the line of demarcation between the two anatomical lobes. Um, is represented by the fissure for ligamentum venosum in the posterior surface and the fissure for ligamentum teres hepatis on the inferior surface. Now the physiological or the functional lobes of the liver are demarcated by a line which passes on the posterior inferior surface of the liver through the fossa for the gallbladder and the groove for the inferior vena cava. And on the anterior respect, this line, uh, imaginary line, joins the inferior vena cava with the cystic notch, which is uh, slightly towards the right of the attachment of the falciform ligament. So this imaginary line demarcating the right and the left physiological lobes is known as the cantilized line or the cholecysto line. Now the physiological or the functional lobes of the liver, right and left lobes is based on the intrahepatic distribution of the right and left branches of the bile ducts, hepatic artery and portal vein. The physiological right and left lobes are approximately equal in size. The caudate and the quadrate lobes of the liver uh, lies respectively on the posterior surface and the inferior surface of the liver. The caudate lobe is bounded on the left side by the fissure for the ligamentum venosum and on the right by the left margin of, of the groove for the inferior vena cava and it extends up to the porta hepatis. And the quadrant lobe, it is bounded on the left by the fissure for the ligamentum teres hepatis and on the right by the left margin of the fossa of the gallbladder. Hepatic segmentation. Within the physiological lobes of the liver, based on the division of the hepatic ducts and vessels, which supply a particular portion of the liver, eight surgically resectable hepatic segments are formed. Within the physiological right lobe, the right hepatic duct and corresponding vessels divide each into anterior and posterior branches. Thus the right lobe presents anterior and posterior segments, and each of these segments is further divided into superior and inferior parts. So here we can see um, the right and the left branches of the hepatic duct and the corresponding vessels. And this is the right branch 
um, distributing within the right lobe, right physiological lobe of the liver. And this is divided into an anterior branch and a posterior branch. And based on this division, the right physiological lobe is divided into the anterior segment and posterior segment. Now, each of these anterior and posterior segments are again divided into superior segments and inferior segments. So here you can see the right anterior division and the right posterior division of the right hemiliver. And this is the anterior superior segment. This is anterior inferior segment. And this is posterior superior segment. And this is posterior inferior segment. Similarly, within the physiological left lobe, the left hepatic duct and corresponding vessels divide into medial and lateral branches. Thus, the left lobe presents medial and lateral segments. The left lateral segment is further divided into anterior and posterior parts. And the hepatic veins draining the hepatic segments are intersegmental, that is, dra drain more than one segment. So here you can see this is, these are the segments of the left hemiliver. This is the medial segment, left medial segment, and this is the left lateral segment. This left lateral segment, it is again divided into the uh, posterior segment and anterior segment. So we have the left medial segment and the left, and the left lateral posterior segment and left lateral anterior segment. Continuing with hepatic segmentation, now what is Connard's segments? According to nomenclature of Connard, the hepatic segments are numbered one to eight in Roman numericals. Segments one to four lie in the left hemiliver and segments five to eight in the right hemiliver. Segment one corresponds to the caudate lobe and segment four corresponds to the quadrate lobe. The caudate lobe is regarded as a separate special segment by many authors because it is drained by both right and left hepatic ducts and supplied by both right and left branches of the hepatic artery and portal vein. So here we can see in the Bonnard segments. So in the anterior view, you cannot see the segment one as it is represented by the caudate lobe. So here, this is on the left hemiliver, this is segment two, three, four, and on the right hemiliver, this is segment five, six, seven, and eight. And on the posterior inferior view, um, here, this is the uh, caudate lobe, which represents segment one. And on the left hemiliver, this is segment two, three, four, which is represented by the quadrate lobe. And on the right hemiliver, uh, here are segment five, six, seven. So from the posterior inferior aspect, you cannot view segment eight. And here you can see this is segment one which is a special segment because it is supplied by both the right and the left hepatic ducts and the corresponding vessels. Since the right and the left hepatic arteries and ducts and branches of the right and left portal veins do not communicate, it is possible to perform hepatic lobectomies and segmentectomies. A large volume of livers, about 80%, can be removed safely because healthy hepatocytes have great capacity to regenerate. The liver can regrow to its original size within 6 to 12 months. Now let's look into the flow of blood and bile in the liver. 
So here you can see a histological picture of a portion of the liver parenchyma showing the hexagonal liver lobules with the central vein in the center and the interlobular portal triad in the periphery of this liver lobule. And you can see a small portion of the liver lobule it has been enlarged and it shows the components of the interlobular portal triad comprising of the hepatic artery, hepatic portal vein, and the biliary duct. And we can also see the positioning of the sinusoids, the bile canaliculi in between the hepatic plates. With the exception of lipids, every substance absorbed by the alimentary tract is received first by the liver via the hepatic portal vein. And that blood along with the blood in the hepatic artery will be poured into the hepatic sinusoids, which will uh, drain into the central vein. In addition to the many metabolic activities, the liver stores glycogen and secretes bile. And here you can see the bile secreted by the hepatocytes travels through the biliary canaliculi in between the uh, hepatocytes. This bile canaliculi is uh, formed by the walls of the hepatocytes itself. And the direction of the flow of bile in this bile canaliculi is opposite to the direction of flow of the blood in the sinusoids. And this bile in the bile canaliculi will ultimately drain into the biliary duct in the portal triad. And from here, it will drain through the biliary tree. So here you can see the biliary tree. So the biliary tree has got an intrahepatic part and an extrahepatic part. So this is the schematic illustration of the intrahepatic and the extrahepatic biliary tree. So here you can see the segmental branches of the hepatic ducts, which are draining the hepatic segments of the liver and they are this uh, prime uh, tertiary uh, branches, they drain into the secondary branches and then into the primary branches. That is the right main hepatic duct and the left main hepatic duct. And this, uh, these two right and left main hepatic ducts then join to form the common hepatic duct, which then joins with the cystic duct and then will continue as the common bile duct. So the extra hepatic part, it consists of the right main hepatic duct, the left main hepatic duct, the common hepatic duct, cystic duct, and the different parts of the common bile duct. Now the extra hepatic biliary apparatus, it has got five components, the right and the left hepatic ducts, the common hepatic duct, the gallbladder, cystic duct, and the bile duct. Here in this figure, you can see the right hepatic duct and the left hepatic duct emerging from the right and the left lobes of the liver. And then they emerge through the porta hepatis and unite at the right end of the of this porta hepatis to form the common hepatic duct and it descends downward for about 2.5 centimeters and it is joined by the cystic duct on the right and then it continues as the common bile duct the angle between the cystic duct and the common hepatic duct is acute and it is known as the hepatocystic angle. The gallbladder. 
So the gallbladder is an elongated pear-shaped sac of about um, 30 to 50 ml capacity. And it lies in the fossa for the gallbladder on the inferior surface of the right lobe of the liver uh, along the right edge of the quadrant lobe. It extends from the right extremity of the porta hepatis up to the inferior border of the liver. Its function is to store and concentrate the bile and discharge it into the duodenum by its muscular contraction. Radio-opaque substances, which can be secreted in the bile, are also concentrated in it. Therefore, they are used to demonstrate radiographically the cavity of the gallbladder and its ability to concentrate and contract which is known as cholecystography. Now the parts of the gallbladder are the fundus, the body, and the, and the neck. Now the fundus, it is the expanded blind end of the organ and it projects from the inferior border of the liver and touches the anterior abdominal wall at the tip of the ninth costal cartilage, deep to the point where the right linear semilunaris meet the costal margin. It is completely surrounded by the peritoneum and it is related anteriorly to the anterior abdominal wall and posteriorly to the transverse colon. Next, the body, it is directed upwards, backwards, and to the left to join the neck at the right end of the porta hepatis. Its up, upper surface is related directly to the liver and is devoid of peritoneum. Its under surface is covered by the peritoneum and is related to the second part of the duodenum. The neck is the narrow upper end of the gallbladder, lying near the right end of the porta hepatis. It joins the cystic duct and uh, its junction with this duct is marked by a constriction. It is related inferiorly, this neck is related inferiorly to the first part of the duodenum. Its posteromedial wall shows a pouch-like dilatation, which is known as the Hartmann's pouch, directed downward and backward. The gallstones lodged in this pouch may cause adhesion with the first part of the duodenum and may perforate it. And this neck sharply turns downward to become continuous with the cystic duct. Now the cystic duct is about three to five centimeter long and it runs backward and downward from the neck of the gallbladder to run in the lesser momentum with the common hepatic duct and joins it at an acute angle to form the bile duct. Its junction with the common hepatic duct is usually situated below the porta hepatis. And the mucous membrane lining the interior of the cystic duct is thrown into a series of crescentic folds, which are five to 10 in number and they project into the lumen of the cystic duct in a spiral fashion, forming a spiral fold, which is known as the spiral, spiral valve of hister. The valve of hister keeps the duct open so that bile can pass through it both in and out of the gallbladder. When the common bile duct is closed at its inferior end. 
the bile secreted by the liver fills the duct and passes through the cystic duct into the gallbladder. Whereas when the common bile duct is open, the bile flows into it from the common hepatic duct and the cystic duct. The flow of bile is augmented by the contraction of the gallbladder. It is coordinated by the relaxation of sphincter of the common bile duct under the influence of cholecystokinin, a hormone released by the duodenum mucosa. Now the bile duct. So the bile duct is formed near the porta hepatis by the union of the cystic duct and the common hepatic duct. And it is usually seven to 10 centimeter in length and about six millimeter in diameter. The parts of the bile duct are the supraduodenal part, the retroduodenal part, the infraduodenal part, and the intraduodenal part. The supraduodenal part, it is above the first part of the duodenum and it descends in the right free margin of the lesser omentum to the right of the hepatic artery. So here in this diagram, we can see this is the supraduodenal part, which is to the right of the hepatic artery. And it is anterior to the, the supraduodenal part is anterior to the portal vein. The retroduodenal part of the bile duct descends behind the second part of the duodenum. And as it descends, it accompanies the gastroduodenal artery on its left and the inferior vena cava on its posterior aspect. The infraduodenal part runs in a groove on the upper and lateral parts of the posterior surface of the pancreas and is sometimes completely embedded in the pancreatic tissue. And on the left side, it is accompanied by the gastroduodenal artery. Near the middle of the second part of the duodenum, it comes in contact with the pancreatic duct. Now, the intraduodenal part of the bile duct, it enters the posteromedial surface of the second part of the duodenum in the posteromedial wall. The main pancreatic duct also enters the wall at the same site. The two ducts run obliquely in the wall of the duodenum and unite to form an expansion, which is known as the hepatopancreatic ampulla of Vetter. And this hepatopancreatic ampulla of Vetter bulges the mucous membrane of the duodenum inward, forming the major duodenal papilla. Now the sphincters present around the terminal parts of the bile and pancreatic ducts and the ampulla. The intramural parts of the bile and pancreatic ducts as well as the ampulla are surrounded by smooth muscle sphincters. The sphincter around the bile duct is called sphincter colidocus of Boyden. And the sphincter around the pancreatic duct is called the sphincter pancreaticus. And the sphincter around the ampulla of Vetter is known as the sphincter of Audi. These three sphincters, they are independent of the duodenal musculature. The sphincters remain closed until the gastric contents enter the duodenum 
stimulating its mucosa to release the hormone cholecystokinin. This hormone, in addition to causing contraction of the gallbladder, relaxes the sphincters, allowing bile and pancreatic secretion to enter the duodenum. Now let's look into the blood supply of the gallbladder and the bile duct. The gallbladder is supplied by the cystic artery, which is a branch of the right hepatic artery. It may arise directly from the main hepatic artery or from the left hepatic artery. The bile duct uh, in its upper part, it is supplied by a twig from the descending branch of the cystic artery. And in the lower part, it is supplied by the ascending branch of the superior pancreaticoduodenal artery. Now this blood supply of the common bile duct is clinically important because if the anastomosis between the superior and the inferior pancreaticoduodenal arteries is poor, the ligation of the superior pancreaticoduodenal artery during surgery can lead to gangrene of the common bile duct. This is the cystohepatic triangle of calot. So here in this figure, you can see this yellow colored area, which is bounded on the left by the common hepatic duct, on the right by the cystic duct, and superiorly by the inferior border of the liver. This forms the cystohepatic triangle of calot, and its apex is directed downwards between the joining of the common hepatic duct and the cystic duct. And the contents of this cystohepatic triangle are the cystic artery, the right hepatic artery, and the cystic lymph node of Lund. It is in this triangle that most of the aberrant segmental hepatic ducts and arteries are usually encountered, which may lead to many complications during surgery. The identification of the cystohepatic triangle and its contents helps the surgeon to locate the pedicle of the gallbladder and its ligation in cholecystectomy. The errors in gallbladder surgery often occur from failure to appreciate the common variations of the extrahepatic biliary system. This occurs especially uh, when the right hepatic artery in the triangle, it presents a caterpillar-like look which is known as the Moynihan's hump, which may be inadvertently clamped, ligated along with the cystic pedicle and cutting, which may lead to profuse bleeding. Moreover, the cystic node of Lund uh, present in the apical part of the triangle receives most of the lymph from the gallbladder and is constantly found and lurched in polycystitis. Now, the cystic and the hepatic ducts, as well as the gallbladder, may show a number of variations. And here you can see in the first figure the union of the cystic duct with the common hepatic duct is very low. So thereby a very long common hepatic duct is formed, whereas the bile duct is very short. Next, the union of the cystic duct with the hepatic duct may be very high and it may unite with the right hepatic duct. Or the cystic duct may have a swerving course alongside the hepatic duct. And there may be a number of accessory hepatic ducts. And sometimes the gallbladder may be folded or there may be double gallbladder. 
So these uh, accessory hepatic ducts, they are seen in 15% of the cases and they usually emerge from the right lobe of the liver and may open in one of the following sites. So they may open into the common hepatic duct, into the neck of the gallbladder, into the body of the gallbladder, or it may open in directly into the common bile duct. So, the accessory hepatic ducts um, may be responsible for oozing of bile from the wound after cholecystectomy. Thank you. So these are the references.